perfect day. The weather forecast calls for overcast conditions with the chance of continuing showers. The sea conditions are a choppy two to three feet with the wind blowing out of the east. Now let's take a look at the history of this fascinating shipwreck. The mistletoe was a wood-hulled side-wheel steamship built in Chester, Pennsylvania in 1872. She was 152 and a half feet long, had a 26 and a half foot beam, displaced 362 gross tons, and was powered by a 370 horsepower engine. The mistletoe was originally built as a lighthouse tender, but was eventually sold and converted into a fishing boat. On May 5, 1924, the mistletoe left the battery and churned her way towards the fishing grounds. She was under the command of Captain Dan Gully and carried 76 passengers, including 15 women and 6 children. At 11.30 a.m., the vessel reached its destination and the anglers began to fish. At 12.45, a man went down into the aft cabin to change his coat and saw smoke coming up from the hold. Captain Gully was summoned from the pilot house and upon seeing the fire, ordered all passengers to the bow. The crew tried desperately to extinguish the flames with both hose and buckets. In less than 30 minutes after the fire had been discovered, the passengers, with the exception of nine volunteer firefighters, were removed onto other fishing boats in the area. The New York Times reports one interesting story during the rescue. William Holmes said that a woman weighing about 300 pounds who was a passenger, fell into his arms and nearly carried both of them over the side. With the aid of two other passengers, she was lowered safely into a fishing boat alongside. Captain Gully was still fighting to save his vessel. At one point, he was lost in the smoke. When he emerged, he collapsed. After being revived, he was taken off the mistletoe in a tugboat. By the time the police and fireboat reached the site, the mistletoe was only a charred wreck and had burned to the waterline. Shortly after, she sank and now sits a few miles off Far Rockaway. It will never be known exactly what caused the fire that day. Captain Gully estimated the total loss at about $50,000. Fortunately, everyone got off safely with the exception of a few minor smoke-related eye injuries. This beautiful illustration was created by Frank Leder of Coastal Creations. Frank distributes this and other original shipwreck illustrations. For further information, contact Coastal Creations Direct at 1-800-572-1255. After examining two Xerox copies of an old newspaper article given to me by Captain Bill Redden, I came across a couple of interesting points. In one of the photographs, you can see that the mistletoe is flying the American flag upside down, a signal of distress. The second photo shows the pilot boat Sandy Hook, which would herself sink in 1939, in the foreground, standing by to lend assistance to the burning mistletoe. Unfortunately, I've not been able to trace the origin of these photographs in order to obtain clearer copies. Today, the mistletoe lies in 42 feet of water, four miles southwest of East Rockaway Inlet. Her burnt wood remains are low-lying and scattered, but provide home for lobsters, ling, blackfish, and even small cod. Divers can easily recognize her wood beams, a winch, the remains of one of her paddle wheels, her boiler, and other assorted machinery. Back aboard the Rebel, we are now just approaching the site of the mistletoe wreck. Captain Bill locates the wreck with a Loran and depth recorder. The mistletoe is a relatively small wreck, but it's not usually difficult to locate or to hook into. Once Bill has positioned the rebel directly over the mistletoe's wreckage, he signals and I throw a grapple anchor over the side to snag into the wreck. It doesn't take long before the grapple grabs and I can secure the rope to the rebel's forward deck cleat. It's now time to get ready to go diving. As Captain Bill reels out a current line, in case any divers surface down current from the boat, we start to suit up. Most of the Wreck Valley dive team chooses to use dry suits for maximum warmth and comfort while diving in these sometimes chilly waters.
stay tuned. Dive Wreck Valley will be right back. Explore the shipwrecks off New York and New Jersey in Danberg's Wreck Valley Volume 2 book for 1895. Finally, it's time to go diving. One by one, we make our way to the side of the boat and jump into the cool Atlantic, eager to see what awaits us below. As Rick and I descend, we find ourselves in green but relatively clear water. Visibility today is approximately 10 feet, which isn't too bad considering recent weather conditions. Once on the bottom, Rick secures the grapple hook into the top of the mistletoe's boiler. It's important to securely tie the hook into the wreck so the boat doesn't break free while we're diving. The boiler is one of the most prominent features of the wreck. Once a diver learns where her boiler is in relationship to her engine, winch, and paddle wheel, navigation around the wreck becomes almost second nature. Her boiler is also quite unique and is configured in an L shape. You will notice that Rick has a small dive light mounted onto his hood. This head-mounted light allows both hands to be free and uncluttered. Brass spikes are common on the mistletoe and can be found protruding from most of her low-lying wood beams. These spikes are prized artifacts, but they're not at all easy to recover. Anyway, Rick and I are not here to look for spikes. We had an alternative motive when we decided to film an episode here. It's been about five years since we have last explored this wreck. But back then, this was our regular hunting grounds. Not only for lobster, but for spearfishing as well. Together, we've probably logged over 50 dives apiece on this little shipwreck. And we thought we knew every inch of her. But recently, I was told that there was a huge fluted anchor on the wreck. Rick and I wanted to return to see firsthand what we had missed five years ago. We were told that the anchor could be located by swimming out in the sand off the wreck's northeast end. As another diver starts to look for lobsters, Rick utilizes a tether line reel and we start our search for the anchor. The tether line will allow us to return to the wreck after our search is complete. After a short swim, Rick spots the webbing from a diver's weight belt protruding from the sand. This wreck is used as a training site by many local dive shops and it's not at all uncommon to find lost dive equipment when searching the sand surrounding the wreck. After continuing our search, another weight belt is spotted, but still no sign of the fluted anchor. After a while, we call off the search and Rick slowly reels his way back to the mistletoe wreck. You can see how he relocates the weight belt on his return trip because he simply dropped the belt over his line. He then takes the time to move both weight belts we found over to our anchor line on top of the boiler. This way we won't have to go looking for them when it's time to ascend. Both weight belts will be raised later to be utilized as spare equipment. Since Rick and I have not been able to locate the fluted anchor we were told about, we decide to take a quick look around the wreck site. Who knows, maybe we'll get lucky and catch a lobster. Another good navigational landmark for divers is this winch, which can be found in the stern just after the wreck's boiler. Copper sheeting can be found almost everywhere on this wreck. It had been used to plate the bottom of her hull so worms couldn't eat through the wood. This wreck is usually surrounded with decent visibility, averaging from 10 to over 25 feet. The mistletoe is ideal for the beginner or novice wreck diver. Her shallow depth and lack of strong current makes the dive relatively easy and certainly enjoyable to explore. Her engine, or stack as it's sometimes called, is the highest relief on the site and rises almost 15 feet off the bottom. The mistletoe is also an excellent spearfishing location. Divers should be able to find a few decent sized blackfish or even sea bass on almost every dive here. In fact, while exploring the wreck today, we've seen quite a few large blackfish. These five to nine pound fish usually stay off in the distance, but a good spear fisherman should have no problem at all taking home a delicious fish dinner. 
Swimming forward on the wreck's port side, we spot some small white tile buried in the sand. Rick digs up a block of the tile, which appears to be from the wreck's galley, or possibly from a bathroom area. Still swimming forward, we spot a pile of anchor chain that we had never seen before. Looking up, we are amazed to find the fluted anchor that we were told was off in the sand, sitting above us and right next to the wreck's edge. This anchor is massive and almost looks too large for the 150-foot mistletoe. The anchor sits along the wreck's port side, just forward of her engine and paddle wheel hub. Rick spots the glimmer of brass and picks up a brass hand railing post and a small washout between the anchor's flutes. Such artifacts are not common on this wreck, and for this piece of brass to be sitting out in the open is amazing. This washout, which exposed the hand railing post, may be the only clue as to why we had not spotted this anchor years ago. We speculate that the anchor's flutes had been buried in the past and only recently uncovered, possibly due to winter storms. If that were the case, it would be easy for a diver to mistake the anchor's shank for another piece of wreckage. Rick moves his hand railing post back to our anchor along with the weight belts. We will take one more look around the wreck before ascending. Rick spots a horseshoe crab that has camouflaged itself by burrowing into the sandy bottom. After pulling the crab out of the sand, it hastily retreats to find another hiding place. These prehistoric looking invertebrates are commonplace on most shallow water inshore wrecks. Rick carefully looks for lobsters by searching under the mistletoe's wood beams. This wreck usually holds a few small bugs, but none are spotted today, and we head over to take one final look at the fluted anchor before heading back to the Rebel. On the way, we pass over the remains of the mistletoe's paddle wheel. The wheel is broken, but divers with a good eye for detail will be able to spot the circular shape and its hub. Divers will also be able to recognize the paddle wheel shaft, which rests inshore of the fluted anchor, as well as other components of her paddle wheel drive machinery. As Rick starts the time-consuming job of removing one of the brass spikes that's securely held into the wreck, I swim back to the fluted anchor and again am amazed at its massive size. Due to the size and style, I'm even beginning to wonder whether this anchor was originally from the mistletoe or possibly from another shipwreck close by. We will definitely be returning to the mistletoe next time with a still camera to photograph this enormous anchor. Finally, our planned bottom time is running out. When I meet up with Rick, he has the brass spike in hand. One of the best parts about diving these shallow wrecks is that even after almost 50 minutes of bottom time, we are still well within the no decompression safety limits. Rick and I will slowly navigate our way back to the boiler and our grapple hook before ascending. It's always a good idea to ascend up the anchor line because this way you avoid having a long swim back to the dive boat. Don't go away, Dive Wreck Valley will be right back. Each climb back up the ladder and board the Rebel. After this shallow but relatively long dive, most of the group of divers on board can be heard not only talking about their diving experiences today, but planning for their next day of wreck diving adventure in an area known as Wreck Valley. I too was quite pleased with today's dive. Visibility was better than I expected it would be, and exploring the mistletoe after all these years has brought back a lot of fond memories.